Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We're so excited to present this webinar for World Vegan Month. My name is Lisa Levinson, and I am the Campaigns Director for In Defense of Animals, and we're here to offer a fireside chat and an expert activist program with you today. And I'm delighted to introduce you to some of my colleagues here at In Defense of Animals. So first of all, we've got uh, our Director of Development, Bob Price is here with us today. Hi, Bob. And then we also have Mary Eastensee, who also is on our development team. Hi, Mary. And I'm thrilled to introduce our Farmed Animals Campaign Coordinator, Leah Wilborn. Hi, Leah. Oh, hi, everyone. So it's our pleasure to offer this special program for you today. And I'm going to turn it over to Leah, who's going to introduce you to our very special guest. All right, thank you. This is quite an honor for all of us. We are here to welcome Dr. Faraz Harsini. Hello, <laughs> unmute. Hi everyone, thanks so much for having me. Very excited. I am so excited. So I um, have to get off my chest that this is one of my favorite activists, actually, um, not to kiss up or anything, but it's the truth. And I like to speak truth. Um, I've been following Faraz and his work for a few years now, and his organization is quite young still. And the strides that um, allied scholars for animal protection, ASAP, how perfect is that, have made in the last just a very short while um, is quite astonishing. So um, Faraz and I are going to chat and he, I'm going to give him the floor shortly. Um, but really briefly now, let me just give you all a little um, intro to Faraz. So he is a biomedical and alternative protein scientist. He is a founder and CEO of Allied Scholars for Animal Protection, a nonprofit that supports and mentors student advocates and future vegan leaders. Their mission is to establish animal rights chapters in every university and to make this world a better place for human and non-human animals. Their vision is the abolition of speciesism, liberation of all non-human animals from exploitation, and to create a world where animal rights are protected. They support students, animal advocates, environmentalists, healthcare professionals, and whoever else wants to join their important cause. So we have an alert happening right now in Defense of Animals is collaborating with ASAP. Um, I just checked and it's almost 7,000 signatures now and we will get into that whole thing and what Faraz is doing and what that alert is about um, shortly. So right now I'm just going to share my screen and I am going to talk some about what In Defense of Animals is doing for World Vegan Month. And this is a new initiative to focus on veganism even more. And uh, we will be talking about some, we'll be handing you some links in the chat and different resources. Um, so I'm going to do this right now and we are gonna get started. And I'm just gonna talk some about what brought me here, how I ended up as a farmed animals campaigner and um, what brought me to veganism and why it's uh, such a passionate um, mission of mine as well. So here we are, it's World Vegan Month. I'm the farmed animals campaigner of In Defense of Animals and we are here with the CEO and founder of Allied Scholars for Animal Protection and we will be speaking to him shortly. So we're both going to be getting into speciesism and humane washing. These are some of the things that we will be talking about. Progressing the vegan movement, speaking up, and the urgency of speaking up and how to do that. Allied scholars for animal protection and opportunities to act and ways to take action. So for me, um, this was something that happened about 12 years ago. Um, we talk some about in the vegan movement, among other vegans, of when 
people are planting seeds and we find out little bits of information here and there. And I barely had any exposure to any vegans. I didn't know any vegans. Um, I didn't know what veganism even meant. It just wasn't on my radar. And um, there are a couple of milestone things that happened. Um, the first was I happened to be in Whole Foods and was next to the cheese counter and overheard a conversation. And um, I happened to hear the lady behind the cheese counter kind of nonchalantly say, it's too bad that the dairy cows are killed for dairy products. What? Um, I was alone. I just didn't even really talk to them, but I just, wait, are you sure? And then um, it, it was a moment that really um, st stood with me my entire life since then. I just couldn't believe, I couldn't believe that I'd gone my whole life and I'd never known this. So there was just kind of outrage and sorrow and um, ashamed that I'd been paying for this. And then also coupled with looking around and seeing everybody else buying these products and realizing most other people don't know this either. And it's not talked about and we don't hear about this. And then seeing the marketing and seeing the happy cows and all the photos uh, that make us feel perfectly fine about buying animal products. So the next thing that happened was um, I happened upon a YouTube video. And there was Paul McCartney speaking and I grew up with the Beatles, and loved Paul McCartney, knew he was a vegetarian and it turned out to be a video called Glass Walls. It was only about eight minutes long. And that was the first time I was exposed to the truth of what really happens behind the scenes in these industries. Um, change me forever. Um, to the, if I start talking about it too much, I'll get emotional, but um, I would wake up in the middle of the night crying. Uh, and I just the realization that um, everything I saw on the screen, I had paid for. Then I started looking into what other activists are doing and slowly but surely started wanting to join them and speak up too. So I had been vegetarian for a while, not realizing that animals are also exploited and killed for their milk and eggs. Um, and that the thing about vegetarianism, it's mostly just about what you're eating. Um, and it doesn't address all the other ways that animals are exploited in entertainment, for breeding, for companionship, fashion, testing, medical research. Faraz will get into that later, I'm sure. He does a lot of work with that. Um, and then I, once I started finding out the truth and seeing the truth, boy, once you know, you can't not know. And I happened to drive past a local, small, organic dairy ranch in my area, got out of the car and connected with this beautiful mother. Um, and that knowledge, knowing not only what she'd already been through, having her babies taken away from her, forcibly impregnated over and over again, but also knowing what she was go about to go through, that soon a truck is going to come for her and force her um, to a slaughterhouse. So it's a very heavy realization once you become vegan, once you've seen the truth. Um, it's a sadness you carry with you, a sorrow you carry with you, but more and more a fire started to burn within me that I needed to start speaking up for these beautiful beings. And off in the distance where all of her babies um, were kept, those are likely the females. Um, if they're male, all of the male, ba male baby dairy cows are slaughtered. So if you don't know that, now you do. Same in the egg industry. Because they are deemed useless. Because they don't produce milk. Little baby chicks, little male baby chicks don't produce eggs. Um, so this is where the females are kept. And if they're male by now, by that point, they probably have already been sent to the slaughterhouse. And yet this is in Petaluma, right? Close to where I live. This is the marketing and marketed to children too. Oh, look, hilarious cartoon characters of dairy cows. Um, and that's a great example of humane washing. So this is um, an example of what we did in an alert recently. Mary's Free Range Chicken, part of Pittman Family Farms. We um, 
actually had thousands of people urge the California Attorney General to prosecute them because along with Free From Harm, this other organization that worked on this with us, they had gathered over years footage of what really goes on behind the scenes at Pittman Family Farms and free range, small local organic. So um, just beware when you when you see these these lovely families, photos of families, the reality and the truth, unfortunately, is far from it. This is the reality. This is the dairy industry. These are that's a that's a male dairy calf that's about to be slaughtered. So legalize cruelty. This is what my um, bust the humane myth campaign is all about, because I want to get across to people that the standard practices in all animal farming are horrific, that we would never put our cats and dogs through, and that even small, local, organic, free range, this happens, okay, and it's all legal. Sexual violation, forcible impregnation, mutilations, of course, without painkillers, um, because they're considered commodities and property, taking babies from their mothers, killing all the male babies in the egg and dairy, dairy industries, and they're all sent to slaughterhouses at a fraction of their natural lifespan. Um, most people don't know that animals are killed um, for food as infants. The only ones who are, are killed a little older are the dairy mothers, the poor dairy cow mothers. Um, so they're actually tormented for longer and it's all for unnecessary products. This is just one example of the horrors that most people don't even know that the most common way that pigs are killed is in CO2 gas chambers. In the United States, in most of Europe, across the world, this is the most common method. Uh, we are told that they just fall asleep. That is the exact opposite of what really happens. They scream, they thrash, they fight for their lives to get out. It's a horrific death. And sometimes they are still conscious when they're slaughtered. And yet, even if they'd lived a nice, safe, happy life, short life before they were killed, our point we're trying to get across is no matter how they were treated on the way to the slaughterhouse, it's all based on exploitation and it's unnecessary. Therefore, we must not take part in it. So speciesism, that beautiful um, dog right there, that's my friend Nick, one of my favorite most precious special beings in the world, beautiful pig right next to him. Um, what is the difference, right? So this is speciesism. It's uh, another form of uh, discrimination and oppression. So there's two kinds. There's we love our cats and dogs and some wildlife and, you know, we advocate for them um, while all the other animals, the other, we we forget about. It's a human supremacy mindset. So there's cats and dogs versus the rest. And then there's humans and then non-human animals um, below us. It's a mindset that says we can objectify and slave, use them as resources, um, use them as commodities, think of them as numbers. Where have we done that before in history, right? Called sentient beings, numbers and things and property. And we all know if you have a cat, a dog, if you've spent any time with an animal, each of them is an individual, they are a someone and not a something. So we come to veganism and the definition of it, and it's simply the principle that humans should live without exploiting other animals. It's a very simple concept. It's been um, a little complicated over the past decades, but this was Leslie Krause, Cross, the co-founder of the Vegan Society, and knowing this and having an understanding of this is what is so important because it is the root of the oppression. It is the root of the suffering and the cruelty um, that if we focus just on suffering and then treating them better within um, the industries that exploit them, that's still not solving the root issue, which is also how we view them. So plant-based, that's a way of eating. It's great. Um, we must talk about that. We must educate on plant-based nutrition. Of course, Dr. Harsini will be talking about that um, shortly, but there is no moral imperative to change. It's about us, really. Plant-based is about what we're eating, and that's great. And you can be a healthy vegan, and you can be in kind of an unhealthy vegan. You can eat junk food, but still be vegan. But vegan is someone who rejects the exploitation of animals. Um, it's, a, it's a principle, it's um, a philosophy, and it's a way of looking at life and viewing other animals. So from my perspective, we must advocate for the world we want, 
We want peace, nonviolence, and to live by the ethos of do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, to put yourself in the victim's position and see things from their perspective instead of constantly from our own perspective. And to realize that this is a justice movement and it's not just food for thought. It's not, well, maybe I'll change and, and thinking of this as a gradual thing when really it's life and death. It's asking ourselves the question from this day forward, how many more animals do we want to be exploited and killed for us? So I, I feel that it is important, and I know that Dr. Harsini feels the same, to normalize veganism, that there is nothing extreme about it, and that we must tell and show the truth, because that is the service that we're doing to the victims. And it's the most respectful thing that we can do um, with our family, with our friends, is tell them the truth. And it has nothing to do with um, being shaming, but it's simply being respectful that we respect our friends and we respect people enough to tell them the truth and not keep the truth hidden, which is what the industries that exploit them do on purpose. So some of the initiatives uh, that IDA is working on, we were at the San Francisco World Vegan Festival and also down in Southern California, VegFest. I gave a talk on vegan advocacy, went into a lot of this um, for half an hour. We have a uh, great love and thrive through the holidays. We have some links that we'll put in the chat. Um, and those are some great free resources and uh, classes. And then we have a Thanksgiving Day support group. Lisa Levinson, our wonderful campaigns director, she has a sustainable activism campaign. So um, please join. Uh, it's to help just get through these days where the social pressure is quite difficult and we need other people who understand. And then we have our alert and we'll have a, a link in the chat. And um, it's all about that that we'll talk about with Dr. Harsini, but we are urging 17, uh, 17 universities that ASAP has a chapter in, uh, animal rights chapter in all of these 17 universities and urging them to go 100% plant-based by 2028 and to educate the healthcare professionals on plant-based nutrition. So this was where um, some of us folks with IDA and also Free From Harm, we took part in this speak out about 10 days ago. We were up in Sacramento at the California Farm Bureau. And this is part of a grassroots movement uh, doing nationwide speak outs um, and organizing around this main theme and message that we wanna get across to the power holders of the food system, including Congress, the USDA, this had the California State Veterinarian present, but it was at the Cattle Health Task Force meeting and it was open to the public. So we went in there, we sat for two and a half hours waiting for the Q&A. And when the Q&A began, each of us, four of us had a different point that we wanted to make. And I was focused on um, ventilation shutdown, mainly because that is the standard way now that they're mass killing animals. Um, as a result of bird flu, which is an industry created problem. Um, they refuse to answer my question and it's really great that we got that on camera. <laughs> uh, so our message is stop the animal ag bailouts, fund a slaughter-free plant-based food system. And it, we are gonna be continuing with this. So anyone feel free to email me because uh, there will be more to come on that and you can join us. All right, bringing it back to the animals. Um, we recently did an alert regarding bird flu and that now we're, we just found out in that meeting that half of the dairy herds in California uh, are under quarantine because of bird flu. This virus is out of control and it's not being covered as much by the media because of course the meat and dairy industry is doing all they can to keep this from us. So we did an alert and this is a video and this is just about the dairy industry, but um, it's a great representation of uh, veganism too. So I'm gonna play that for you now.
Okay. Um, I'll end with this quote. I'm going to turn it over to Faraz. Never be afraid to do what's right, especially if the well-being of a person or an animal is at stake. Society's punishments are small compared to the wounds we inflict on our soul when we look the other way. Martin Luther King Jr. This is the message that we are getting across today. And now <laughs> I am going to turn it over to Dr. Faraz Harsini. Thanks for having me. And I love your intro. You set the tone really right, um, emphasizing on the seriousness of veganism and how it's a moral urgency. Uh, I love the last quote that you showed. Um, I think if we were walking and somebody, we saw someone beating a dog, we will not think twice. We'll take action. We'll sometimes even put ourselves in harm to save the dog and stop the person beating the dog. But when it comes to cows and chickens and pigs and fish, um, all this cruelty happens a lot worse, except behind the doors. Um, we just don't see it. And it shouldn't lose its sense of urgency just because it happens behind the doors and not in front of us. And, you know, oftentimes when it comes to speaking up or going vegan, we say it's hard or, you know, maybe I'm, you know, I'm shy. I don't know if I can do it, maybe later. Um, but the truth is we do have that sense of urgency if it was happening in front of us. We just have to make the connection and understand the depth of uh, animal oppression. And once you realize that, you just feel such fire in your heart that um, uh, you can't be silent. Um, you want to do nothing but stand up for uh, for the victims. So thanks for having me. Thank you. And absolutely and exactly. So tell us, Faraz, if you would, um, how you how you came to this and maybe a little bit about your background. And for anyone that doesn't know, you were born and raised in Iran. Yes. Yeah, I'm uh, originally from Tehran, Iran. Uh, and, you know, throughout my college, I participated in a lot of protests for human rights, uh, got tear gassed, almost got killed in some of the protests, managed to escape. Uh, and that sort of, um, that was the beginning of my journey in like fighting for something like bigger than myself. And, um, uh, when I came to the US, I started my studies in biomedical sciences. And um, from another side, every disease I ever studied came back to the food system from chron chronic diseases to zoonotic diseases and pandemics. And, you know, top cause of death, heart disease correlated heavily um, with saturated fat and endotoxins and um, things that you often find in animal products, especially meat and da dairy. Um, so that was one thing. And then, uh, I think the biggest shift was when I was actually, ironically, I was trying to rescue animals and I went to one of my friends and said, Hey, help me. I'm trying to encourage Iranians not to buy goldfish for Persian new year, because that's a tradition that we have, um, and millions of fish die. Um, we don't eat them. Of, co of course, it's just like a sign of, ironically, a sign of freedom and liberation and, life and uh, happiness and wealth, whatever. And I was trying to you know, encourage Iranians not to do that because a lot of fish die. And my friend refused to help me and said, you don't make any sense. You eat animals, you, eat, you literally eat fish. And here you are trying to sell it, save uh, goldfish. And uh, I was a little uh, buttered, uh, didn't like to hear that. Uh, but that really changed me. Um, and I'm so grateful for my friend that had the courage to speak up. She could be worried about losing our friendship and not say anything. Uh, I think that's something that most of us would do. We don't want to be, be the bad guy. We don't want to be the pushy vegan. We don't want to 
be called like judgmental and all that. We don't speak up, but my friend did speak up and here I am today dedicating my life to this. The same way that that lady, when you were in grocery store said one thing, just said, you know, this dairy, dairy cows die or killed. And that just uh, ignited a fire in you that, uh, you know, continues and is burning um, until today. So uh, yeah, when my, my friend said that, um, I started looking into it, finally became vegan. But when I put all these pieces together, I realized that it's not just about diet. It's not about, you know, helping animals. It's the biggest form of oppression of all time. There is nothing in this world, in, like in today's world, that causes so much suffering and is as neglected as it is today. You talk about all these terrible things that are happening to dairy cows and you ask people to go vegan and they say, you know, but I like cheese. Like as if like you didn't, they didn't even hear you. They didn't even, it doesn't register the amount of stuff. It's very neglected. And I don't say it's like people's problems because we are conditioned. Just today in University of Arizona, I mean, our target audience is uh, college students, but this kid, uh, I think she was probably three or four came. We had a booth. We were uh, pretending that we were selling uh, human milk. Yes. And it grosses people out. And then we say, how, how come human milk is gross, but like you consume dairy? But this was a kid and I'm not really good at dealing with kids. Um, uh, so I sat down and started like talking to her and uh, I said, you know, I, you know, uh, why do you think humans make milk? And she said, you know, yeah, my mom made milk. It was for my sister. I was like, yeah, great. So, and then we had a blown up cow. Um, and I said, why do you think a mother cow makes milk? And she said, for us. And then I tried to explain that, you know, no, they have their own babies and stuff like that. And then I asked her again and said, now, why do you think the cow produces milk? And she said, for us, it's just like a kid wow. at age of three or four was already conditioned to look at cows as milking machines. I was able to make progress. And at the end of the day, I said, so when you're going home, if your mom is trying to push you to eat meat, what are you going to say? And she said, no, like, I will say no, you know, because... I said, do you like animals? She said, yes. Uh, I said, do you realize that when we eat meat, animals have to die? She said, oh, that's really bad. I don't want that. And I mean, the good thing about kids is it's so simple. They just get it. But unfortunately, we become conditioned just the, the same way I was. Um, and I think that the lowest I've ever been in my life as a human is the day... Um, I told myself like I could never go vegetarian. Sorry, animals. Just one second of you dying. I just love meat and then, you know, cheese so much. So even when I knew what was happening, I still said, sorry, I just love meat so much. And I think that's the lowest I've ever been. Um, and I look at that moment uh, with shame. And I'm embarrassed that as someone who ever since I was in college, I was trying to like fight against oppression and, you know, fight for humans and all that stuff, even was trying to help animals. Still, when I was exposed to the truth, I was telling myself, you know, sorry, animals, I can't do it. I just love meat so much. It's like one second of you. First of all, we know that it's not one second of one second of suffering. It's like these animals are exploited from the second they're born until the, the second they're slaughtered. But even if it was one second of killing them after a good life, it still doesn't justify. Like there was a time that I said, one moment of me liking cheese and meat and steak and bacon that, that were my favorite foods uh, is worth more than your life. How dare we? How dare we to look at other animals with such a supremacy and say a moment of my pleasure is worth more than your entire existence. So... After I really realized the depth of oppression, I was like, and the connectedness with also human suffering, you know, you look at um, antibiotic resistance, pandemics. I always say, if, even if you hate animals, you should still be plant-based because every time we have meat, egg, dairy, we are increasing the risk of uh, pandemics, antibiotic resistance, which means that if I had egg, for instance, I increase the risk of bird flu, which means that I did something wrong to you. So it's my moral responsibility to all of you not to eat this this stuff. 
But uh, yeah, but it just tells you how big the scale of animal oppression has be is that it's become a environmental and public health, uh, public health hazard. And that's why I want to stop it. Like there is no fight better than uh, this. There is no uh, form of oppression as big as this and no cause as as good as animal rights to to fight for because it causes the most amount of suffering. It's And it's absolutely neglected. And the good news is uh, it's absolutely preventable. If more people do the right thing and we have more people to speak up, um, whatever that speaking up means, sometimes like saying a simple thing like uh, with you, Leah, that, that lady who said something when you were looking at milk, it could be donations, it could be with carriers, uh, whatever that means to somebody uh, speaking up, but it just means doing something. There's one thing I know for sure that this will not end if we stay silent. Um, in the face of injustice, silence is just is not, not an, an option. option. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Hey, I mean, I was one of, I, I didn't go vegan overnight. But yeah, everybody should hear this too. And even though we advocate for the urgency of it, and we advocate in a way that is um, trying to simply give people the information, telling them the truth, being matter of fact about it, and not apologetic that we're telling them the truth. Um, but that that is so necessary. And at the same time, we understand that we didn't go vegan overnight either, but better to simply state the truth and have people know it and they're gonna do with it what they will. And the way everybody responds differently. And like you said, that was the lowest moment of your life when you um, realized that you were deciding, you were consciously choosing, well, sorry, animals, too bad. because. I, I'm troubled and I'm stressed and I can't deal with thinking about yet another thing. I understand that. And I didn't go vegan overnight either. And I had those same moments too. And it's so interesting that depending on where one is in one's life and what they might be going through at the time, um, it can be so easy to simply just go along to get along because it is certainly easier to be a human in this world if you just go along with what everybody else is doing. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, I think one reason that it took me such a long time is because I didn't have uh, somebody like you or myself uh, to talk to me. I was all by myself. My friend said that she never even told me that I had to go vegan. That was like, she left it at that. So this was all a process in my head and it took a while. But I think if somebody told me, do you think, a simple question, do you think your taste and pleasure would justify killing animals? I think that would have made me thought uh, more deeply. If someone said, yes, going vegan might be harder, but do you think it's harder for you to be vegan? Or do you think it's harder for um, for animals to go through that? That would have clarified the situation a lot, uh, a lot more. And most importantly, if somebody said, if you were in place of those animals, how urgently would you want the exploitation to end? I would have probably told you immediately. Um, so I think if someone said, you know, as long as you are not vegan, you're paying for this thing that is in misalignment with your own values, I think uh, I would have changed a lot faster. I think that part of the reason that it took such a long time is uh, because I never, it at first it didn't feel like a form of oppression and injustice. Right. And today when I tell people, I'm like, Think about it as any other form of injustice. Imagine if I was beating a dog. Imagine if I was racist and then you wanted me to stop. And I said, I'm just doing my best. You know, I'm taking my time. Um, I'm starting going uh, non, non racist from like January. And, uh, you know, maybe college students tell me all the time, like, I want to go vegan, but after graduation. Um, uh, imagine if someone said that about racism. I'm, you know, you're right. I just like, I grew up this way. It's just really hard not to be racist nowadays. And, you know, when I graduate, I'm planning on slowly shifting to not being racist. We just don't accept that for any other form of injustice. We just accept it when it comes to animal oppression, which again, emphasizes like how neglected it is, how little we think of animals that we come up with all these sort of excuses to uh, continue. Um, and this is something we need to change. Absolutely. So I actually just had a, 
a little exchange earlier today with someone and um, she's vegan too. And we were talking about just how, how we speak to people about it. And I know that so many people probably watching this would love to hear your advice for, yes, but it's so awkward and it's so hard. And what about, you know, I have my husband and my family and I don't want, I don't want to create tension and all of this. What, what is the advice that you would give to people for conveying this the way that we're talking about it, but in a way that is very mature and strong, unapologetic, but also understanding and, and letting them know that you've been there too and you get it, but without compromising the message. Yeah, I think the most important thing is not to compromise for your own values and uh, speak up. Like, think it, all I ask you is to just treat this like any other form of oppression and ask yourself one simple question. Would you have done that for any other form of oppression? Or if it was another form of oppression, what would you have done? Uh, imagine your husband comes home and, uh, you know, uh, you know that at work they just you know, killed dogs or, you know, harmed other animals or your partner is like racist. You're not going to put up with that, right? Now, don't say that not being vegan is equivalent of that. But what I'm trying to say is that it's a form of oppression and most people just don't know. So I think that everyone deserves the uh, education. So if it's a partner, if it's a family member, I think uh, one good way that I found to talk to people, this is really hard, like with, with friends, with family members, it's really it's hard. Hard. It's it's hard. a lot harder than, yeah. uh, than people you don't know. So one thing I really found to be helpful is that, you know, I grew up, you know, you know me, I wasn't always vegan, but now I learned this. This is something I just had no idea, but I do have this urge to also tell you about it because I don't know what you think of me. You Maybe you think you are, Maybe you're thinking like I'm I just I've gone crazy suddenly. But I really, because I love you so much, I want you to understand what's how I'm feeling. And every time you make it about yourself, people can like listen to you. You don't have to say like um you can say anything about yourself and people don't get uh, upset. You can say, hey, I was I realized that I was like abusing animals, I was paying for these animals to be killed. That lands a lot differently than if you tell people like you are paying for animals to be killed, despite the fact that they're basically the same thing. But I think when you say that about yourself and you're honest with them, it's a very different story. Also realize that when you realize something is the right thing to do, imagine that you grew up, nobody told you that smoking is bad. Everyone is smoking. You used to smoke. Now somebody told you hey, do you know smoking causes cancer? And you're like, wow, I didn't know. And then you stop doing that. And you feel this urge to also tell your friends and family and stop them from smoking, right? That's a compassionate thing to do. You're just so afraid of being called judgmental and as if like judging is wrong. Judging judging is not wrong. Um, every discernment, group, right? It's discernment. Judging it's, right from wrong is how we live in this society, yes? Like every, like when you ask your friend what restaurant is good to, to eat at, you know, that's, you're asking for judgment. Uh, the, the trick is we should judge righteously. So if I judge my partner because I don't like their uh, physique, that's, you know, bad judgment because they can't probably do something about that. But if I, like my friend judged me, my friend absolutely judged me, said that, you know, for us, you, you eat animals and you're here, you are. I think that she did that because she respected me and she thought that I, I could do better. And otherwise, why, why would she even point that out, right? So you can actually approach this from a place of kindness and compassion and let other people know that this is something that is happening. And the only reason you're mentioning this is because you care about those animals and you care about those people and you don't want them to be a part of this. And then we also have to ask ourselves, why do we need other people's support? And are we compromising our values? For instance, am I in a relationship? What, why do I really want a relationship? I think I want a relationship. I want to be in a relationship where if I'm wrong, my partner will actually come and say, uh, hey, that was not okay. You should do better. The same way that my friend did that, right? Um, do we really need people in our life who hold us accountable because they think we can do better and they say the truth? Uh, or do we just want to surround ourselves with people 
with whom we don't even have the courage to speak our mind. We don't even have the courage to say who we are and what our values are and how this something simple as as simple as like killing animals is wrong. We can't even like verbalize that because we're worried that they get offended. Is that a really type of a relationship that we even want? And it's okay if that's the, the answer is yes, but we have to be clear that we are letting our own values down. We are letting justice down because we just need this sort of relationship. So that really actually helped me to ask myself, what kind of relationship do, do I want? Um, and, you know, uh, but yeah, I think those, those should help people, like just make it about yourself, remind yourself that you don't think that you're superior or they're inferior. It's just because you used to be there, right? You used to meet a dairy. This is just a knowledge that you acquired and you're just aligning your actions with your values and yeah. And use any opportunity. Like you can, um, uh, if, if it's your birthday, take them to a vegan restaurant. Use use that as, a, as an excuse. I know people who wrote letters um, to their family members or ask them to sit down with them and watch Dominion. Um, and, you know, the answer might be different. Sometimes you try and you fail. The, it doesn't matter. The result doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that you saw injustice, you didn't shy away, and you, you tried your best. That's the only thing that matters. That's right. And I, I had a moment with my dad about 10 years ago where he was open to, because he at least, and I'm grateful because I know a lot of people's families don't have this, but he at least supports what I do and respects it. He's still not vegan. A lot of that, I think, is just to do, he just lives in another area. His wife isn't vegan. And so, you know, I fully admit to everyone, it's like, it's really difficult. Um, it can be really difficult with people in your close relationships. But what I've found is, and just being vegan and speaking up in the way that I feel I'm compelled to, it's it's changed me too, because sometimes it does mean that certain friendships and relationships kind of start to fade away a little bit. And, you know, that's okay if it's with a person who just um doesn't respect what you're saying to them and doesn't want to hear it and it's okay and it's not like i'm going around telling everybody when i'm having one-on-one -on -one conversations with people in social situations i don't always bring it up you know if it comes up i'm comfortable now after years <laughs> finally but it took me years to say to everybody too by the way i mean it took me years i started quietly posting occasionally on social media, but I started out being kind of apologetic and, you know, like, I hope this isn't too much. I know this is a lot, but, you know, um, and after a while I didn't really respect, I, I was losing respect for myself because I knew that that was more to do with, I just want people to like me and I don't, I don't want to lose any friends over this. You nailed it. It's uh, at the end of the day about us, uh, trying to respect ourselves and our values and also standing up for um, um, animals. Uh, yeah. You brought up Dominion for us. So you have been, uh, well, first of all, didn't you and your co-founder Darius meet uh, doing Anonymous for the Voiceless? And you might want to explain what that is to folks if they don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just remember something about the previous conversation. So one thing that I found to be very helpful is um, just telling people that I actually really appreciate your relationship. So um, it's just the, the food. So you can like always talk to them about the food. Um, and um, I think we owe it to animals and ourselves, like a, as a matter of like self-respect to just stand up for the animals. And a perspective I'd like to share with you is that we are so worried about losing friends, but really one way to think about it is like, if you told your family that you have allergy to dairy, they would understand. They would like leave dairy out of like the food that they cook. If you told them that for religious reasons, you don't eat meat, uh, they would be like, oh, okay. So I'll be happy to go somewhere with you that has kosher or halal. It's only when it's a moral thing, it's, it's even like more valuable that people sometimes like, uh, we are afraid that people might react. And then at that point, we have to ask ourselves, do I want to be friends and in relationship with someone who cannot respect the most valuable uh, values of my life? So 
something to uh, think upon. Uh, to answer your question, yeah, we were doing uh, anonymous for the voiceless. We were showing footage of uh, Dominion, um, uh, basically legal and standard practices of meat, egg, dairy, leather, fur, animal testing, all that. And um, yeah, it's a very good and effective way to show the footage and inform people. And that's where I found uh, ASAP's co-founder. So yes, sometimes you lose friends and sometimes you find uh, your best friends and colleagues and uh, partners and all that when you do activism. You find like-minded people with the same values. That's right. And I want to encourage everybody because I didn't, like I said, I didn't know any vegans when I first went vegan. I felt very alone and isolated in it. Um, and boy, you know, once I started seeking out other vegans, but more specifically activists who inspired me and like hanging out with them and like, wow, I can't believe they said that. I can't believe they're doing this. Oh my gosh. And then just, um, it starts to rub off on you a little bit and you start to realize, well, if they can speak up the way that they're doing, I can too, maybe. And you do, you make new friends, you get a whole new circle. And that's not to say that you leave your non-vegan friends behind um, necessarily. It's just all depends on the relationship that you have with them. But um, I think we're I think we're probably going to have some questions. Mary, do we have questions? We have two questions in the chat. Yeah. So. yeah. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. You're talking uh, so much truth and I love it. Um, let me just dive right into a, a question we got. One person said, some of my clients do not care one bit about animals. I know it's conditioning, but they are only health. Not sure how to break through by helping them learn compassion. Is that something you can teach mm -hmm. or convince someone of? Yeah, unfortunately, there is no magic for it. I mean, sometimes people care about health and you can take that aspect and environment and when people don't eat uh, animal products or eat less of it, I think they're a little more open um, to think about animals. But uh, I think I had a lot of people who tell me, like, I just don't care, but I don't think they, they, are, uh, they mean it. I ask them, so if you step on a dog's foot and they yelp, you're just like, mm -hmm, I don't know, I don't care. Absolutely not. Like the only people, I sometimes tell them, like, I'm just like, the only people who actually don't care are psychopaths. And I don't think you're a psychopath. I think you are just saying that because you know that if you accept that this is bad, the next thing is then yeah. why are we eating these animals? Sometimes right. when you actually tell it that way, they're like, they actually back down and you reset the conversation. Like, yeah. I know that deep inside, you know that. Uh, but I also want to say, there is no magic recipe that works for everybody. Right. Uh, there are psychopaths around who would not change. There are people you can tell them anything they would not change. And that's okay. Uh, we should, we are not responsible with, for what people do. We are responsible for what we do. And part of what we have to do and we're responsible for is to actually stand up for animals. But once you speak the truth, once you educate people, unfortunately, we can't force anyone to, to do that. But the good right. news for you is that in no other form of oppression, we succeeded and morally advanced because the entire society was on board. We didn't get rid of slavery because the entire United States decided that this is wrong. It was a small group of people who were active and then we literally went to war. Like there was actually war because yeah. one side didn't want to give it up. Yeah. So that just means that something could be as clearly wrong as slavery and people would still want to hold on to it. Um, so, but, nonetheless i think that no evil lasts forever and all we are responsible right now is to just make sure we do our best and when you do that people change and i i, I guess my motto is uh uh every time society changes it's because of a small group of thoughtful and dedicated individuals so we don't need 100 percent of people to go vegan we need certain group to go vegan and get active and speak up right Right. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. All right. So we have one more question from Monica. She says, when I talk about industrial animal processing, I often get pushback that I'm infringing on their right to eat meat. How do I open their eyes that it's animal lives? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, obviously it's a free country, but the, our freedom ends when someone else's freedom is jeopardized. Um, and 
you know, I can say, hey, so if I was like beating a dog in front of you, what would you actually do? You know, uh, what if I said, well, it's my freedom and right to beat, beat the shit out of this animal. You know, would you accept that as, a, as an excuse? You could literally use that excuse to justify any form of oppression. You could say, hey, you know, it's my right to be racist. And yes, you can actually be racist and you will not go to jail for just being racist, but you're harming people. And is this the type of person that you want to be? And oftentimes you can, another positive thing that we can say is like, of course you have freedom, of course you have power, of course you have strength, and of course you can do this to animals, but you can use all those things to actually make the world a better place. Why are we using our freedom to hurt others when we can actually use our freedom to go out of our way to speak up for them? Mm -hmm. um, why do we want to exploit our or abuse our power and, and freedom to hurt other animals? Right. And I think you know, simply put yourself in place of those animals and see how you feel. But right. again, you know, you say that sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and it doesn't matter. You you have to yeah. just say the right thing. It's like you're warring against the cognitive dissonance and and the desire to like push back against the fact that there's hypocrisy. Loving, you know, your dear dog and cat, you love them so much, and then eating a burger. And it's like obviously there's hypocrisy happening and you need the cognitive dissonance in order to maintain that hypocrisy so you you cling to it they cling to this cognitive dissonance you know so um there was one more question that i think is like a good transition uh about um what are what are the next um best oh i just lost it again the the best uh plant-based proteins Mm. that that we want to here we are good here we are what are some good sources of vegetable protein i don't want to have too much tofu in my diet uh so i am seeking other sources of protein is it good to take powders and supplements um what yeah so all plants have pro proteins good like for I muscles think, and health for vegans yeah i don't think anyone has to be necessarily um, go to a doctor and see when was the last patient they, they had to treat for protein deficiency. Um, so I don't, in general, I don't think it's, it's an issue, but yeah, I mean, soy is a great source of complete protein. And then you have pea, pea protein, um, uh, whole food plant-based source of protein. I mean, uh, legumes, um, beans and uh, lentils, lentils are my favorite. Um, then you have, you know, other, you know, Satan and stuff, other sort sorts of like processed uh, plant-based foods. Uh, if you really want to get like supplemented, yeah, protein powder. But I think we have more important things to talk about. Proteins is uh, is the, the easiest mean, thing to get. This is about the implementation of what we're talking about. We've been talking about the ethics, and then it's about implementation. So it's so understandable that people are yeah. asking the next questions of like, now that I have this logic, what do I do? What is yeah. the next step? And Absolutely. totally right about the protein thing. But there's just so many awesome sources of protein out there that are plant based. Uh, the you know animal big ag is trying to get us to think that the only sources of protein out there are chicken, beef, pork, egg, you know, cheese, you know, th that's it. They don't want you to know about all these other awesome sources of protein. There's quinoa, there's chia, there's farro, which is a grain, and we have chickpeas and lentils and so many legumes, like the list is amazing. There are yep. plenty of sources of B12. I see people are giving all of their, all yeah. their different. There's you so know, many. I see Linda, I see Linda great... the vegan mentor is in the chat. She's an 80 year old vegan activist that I did a speak out with. I did two speak outs with her. So hi, Linda. But she, and she's also a plant-based coach, but she's a hardcore vegan activist too. And she speaks up for animals. So yeah, great. but she's it's just such a huge topic. topic and there's yeah. so much we could go into and talk about. We have one sure minute left. Another. Oh my God. Let me just oh, man, one minute. <laughs> yeah, everybody. Um, and Mary, if you can maybe put it in the chat again about the alert for people sure. to the alert. I'll grab um, it. To urge uh, the 17 universities where Faraz has his ASAP chapters, animal rights chapters, and how perfect would that be to get all seven, including Harvard, MIT, UC Berkeley, where he's going to be in two days. Um, 
please everybody sign the alert. And here's Lisa <laughs> to send us off. Yeah, so with uh, Allied Scholars and IDEA, we we're trying to uh, get a lot of these universities to actually go plant-based. And um, we combine that with our underground support that we have chapters in universities because I think we want to change the culture and society oftentimes changes and follows the universities. We have tons of young students. They have their entire careers ahead, ahead of them. So the idea is to change the culture as, as well as influencing the individual. So make them understand that veganism is a moral urgency. So they graduate, they choose careers that are aligned with those. Uh, we want to invest in the future generation of thought leaders, uh, policymakers, doctors, lawyers, funders, donors, all that. These people come from universities and in universities we have the power of exposing students every single day. Right now, students go through four years of college, four years of medical school without ever thinking about animals and veganism. We want the opposite of that. I, I, want, I want to make it impossible for students to go one day about their lives without being exposed to something about benefits of plant-based diet or veganism or uh, you know, intense and systematic education. So we are building the first infrastructure for unified and effective animal advocacy. And my goal is to be in top 100, top 100 universities and one of our works, one of the one of our pillars is working with dining halls to go plant based. So in this case, we partnered with IDA, and thank you for your help. We're sending thousands of emails to all these universities asking them they should go plant based immediately. Yes, I'm so stoked. <laughs> thank you so much, um, Dr. Faraz Harsini. This has been an absolute honor to have you as our special guest today. Uh, this is our celebration for World Vegan Month. And I think this is a really appropriate way to celebrate by going back to the roots of veganism. And Malia, thank you for that incredible and informative presentation with all the visuals. It was very compelling. Sure, thank you. Thanks to everybody, thank you everybody for, for being us. here. And thank you, Dr. Harsini. Um, it's, it's such an honor. And thank you for everything you're doing. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thanks We're very eager to collaborate with you and to continue. Yeah, let's continue. Yeah, we've got lots, lots to do. And thank you, Mary, for- Yes, Mary and Bob. With all the chats and to everyone who was chatting, we're so grateful to all of you for being here today. We wish you a very happy World Vegan Month. And, and World Vegan Day every day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Worth with the vegan message. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for signing the alert as well.